Sean Mucci. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, he is a professor of statistics and data science at the University of Caen, and uh, he recently, or uh, yeah, you know, recent, but September 22, he joined to the Technological Research Institute IRT Systems System X, the research and technology organization of Paris Saturday, where he is the scientific head of data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, and his talk will be on, on some statistical and machine learning problems in research and engineering. We are glad to have you here today. Uh, thanks. Thank you all very much, uh, Zahir, for uh, the introduction. And uh, many thanks to all of you for being uh, here or at distance uh, via Zoom. I'm really very happy to be here and uh, to talk and uh, uh, to get in touch uh, with you. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I would like also to thank uh, the people from the uh, each uh, for their work. I got interesting discussions with uh, Denise, with Nasihan, uh, with the neighbors of these guys, Safna and colleagues. Let me really help. And uh, I want to take uh, this opportunity to talk uh, to you about, um, in, in the first part, about things I. Um, I was um, personally uh, much involved in them and in other uh, part about some works um, with my uh, colleagues at the Systemics to present you the Institute and uh, our collaborations with our partners. There is, as you can see, uh, a lot of slides, uh, but uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions about uh, something or I will see if I need to go passing in other things. Uh, I plan to talk to you about some statistical and machine learning uh, approaches and problems in research and uh, engineering. So the title is a bit generic, but the focus will be on, in the first part about um, a family of models, statistical models to learn of some uh, a bit small data and then maybe bigger, a bigger kind of data um, related to hybrid and trustworthy AI. I will take a present system mix later. And uh, I start by uh, saying that, uh, as all of you uh, should know, that um, the thing of treating data is now of uh, very high interest, uh, both in uh, academia and in industry. I uh, gave to you uh, here in the slide uh, some examples about uh, different type of uh, data and uh, the, the, the complexity. It can be on terms of uh, heterogeneity. You can say, for example, here, a heterogeneous time series. You can uh, uh, be interested in predicting them or clustering them or segmenting them. And also, you can see other kind of data here, like audio. For example, when I've been on Toulon with some colleagues, we have been interested in to, trying to understand how, for example, marine mammals do vocalize or how birds communicate. And at the end, we translated this as a problem of machine learning and clustering. And also, there is the data coming from uh, medicine. Uh, typical applications are how to look at, localize uh, tumor, tumor uh, regions, also uh, related to these um, uh, medical applications. You can also be interested into the robotic parts, how to detect uh, the different uh, motions of uh, a person, or a more generic part, how to or it has some, some events is including, for example, <laughs> uh, precipitation. Um, this is just to say we uncontrol data everywhere. And uh, uh, for my research and my PhD students and uh, colleagues, we have been looking to treat this kind of data with some statistical approaches. I mean, we are, we try to care about uh, uh, providing some statistical guarantees to the approaches we develop and also to construct uh, some algorithms that can operate uh, typically in a supervised way and uh, to try to provide some interpretable results because at the end we could imagine that the final user and the final site could be would have some demand uh, uh, about this aspect and uh, the models we examine examine they are uh, 
they are part of what we call latent variable models in the sense that you suppose that the variable X you observe, where it is a just marginal observation of more general complex phenomena, which integrates X and Z, but in Z, we do not you do not really observe it. And to learn the functional F, which is possibly parametric with parameter theta here, you need to reconstruct this Z. And for example, typical applications here is about clustering. And so it is at the end the problem of learning and presentation and model selection. If you have different model in computation, how to select the best, the best model. And uh, here we talk, for example, about mixture models or their extension mixture of experts. And one of the issues how to estimate these models in a high dimensional setting, typically when the number of predictors is higher or even higher than the number of observations, or how to estimate these models when you have a distributed setting. Um, just to, to, to illustrate it before going uh, into uh, much into uh, math, ma this is not the idea, but to, 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 to synthesize the idea is suppose, for example, you observe some observations they exact for some quantity y that depends on some quantity x x for example is a, a predictor or set of predictor or set of predictors and so how to learn some density as you see in the middle uh, curve here uh, together with accounting for the internal the inherent structure to this data the typical idea for example how to Fit the density f of y given x and at the same time explain the fact that in different region of the model the distribution is not the same and you explicitly figure out what is the local distribution that would be most relevant there as you can see here in the, in the western part one kind of models we are familiar with and we we examine them a bit um, for some time, both in, in the application level, but also on the methodology, on the methodological, methodological level, so it's a mixture of experts. The, 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 the principle is a, a bit of, uh, it's quite simple. If you have some input or predictor X and you need to predict some Y given X, you can apply your uh, the principle of uh, divide and conquer, and then you can propagate this X to different experts. An expert can be a simple distribution, for example, a Gaussian, and then you combine their local, their, ex their different predictions, and you weight them uh, uh, by some uh, gating weight, therefore gate Y to gate K, K being the number of experts, you get at the end of eight right two. This is traditionally statistical model but it looks like also as a, a neural, simple neural network level. And uh, the idea is how to estimate to fit this model to this data, and at the same time, how to reconstruct the structure of this data. And the question is typically like that, if you have some data, uh, which one of these models would be the most, uh, uh, the most uh, relevant to this data? At the end, it is a, a model selection problem. And so typical typical um, solution is to maximize uh, some uh, um, likelihood loss, potentially penalize, I will show later that penalization is a, a good way to proceed in some situation for uh, model selection and also for uh, variable selection. Here typically uh, for, uh, I think for this situation, the fourth uh, model, uh, this one is the most, uh, most relevant which is the same representation like here here you see the density and the local models and here you see only the local models and also uh, it is both a combined um, framework of uh, regression and classic of course if your main objective is grant is regression then you can accept the less relevant models for clustering and vice versa um does it go back to this kind of model of modeling mixture of experts are an extension of uh, um, mixture distribution 
And if you have some observation X, just X is a, I have a, for example, a sample of uh, independent and I didn't, I didn't don't can be distributed the, uh, uh, the variables X, I, which live on some uh, space X, and you want to approximate uh, the bare density F, uh, you can approximate F within the class of finite, the probably finite location scale mixtures, which are defined here by the family of I H with the kernel phi and phi the kernel you can see here and the, the uh, um, this family is uh, the, also depends on parameter k which is the number of distribution in the mixture so a mixture distribution h with number of components k with kernel phi can be expressed like that it is a weighted sum of this kernel located at some mean u and with some with some scale sigma and weighted by some uh, weight pi, uh, pi here. and the, the, these weights they are probability so they are positive and, and, and some to one typical example of this mixture they are gaussian gaussian mixtures what what is known in literature, and this is what also looked at at some moment, is if you take any probability density function f, if you take a, a kernel function phi that is continuous, uh, sorry, that is continuous, and if you are working on a compact set x, and then there exists a sequence of mixture distribution such that you can approximate this unknown function f in the supremum node. That means, in fact, you can take, if you take more and more number of components, scale, you converge towards the true distribution f. And you can even get a, a better result, a more robust result for p more than one or more if f is a little bit pdf. And uh, if the kernel you take has some properties here, it is, for example, essentially bounded p pdf uh, in the distribution outside your compact uh, S is, uh, is, uh, is, is zero, uh, the measure, sorry, outside this uh, set is zero. So there exists a sequence of pitch distribution uh, that converges toward the true distribution error in, uh, in, the, in, the Lebesgue, in, the, in the Lebesgue mode, okay? In fact, on this agenda, these mixture of distribution from a statistical point of view, they, they uh, enjoy uh, good statistical results. And we can extend these results to the example I just showed to you. If now you have not only X, you observe some X and you want to predict from this X some quantity Y, it's over here, you observe, observe a sample of pairs X and Y. And if you want to fit here, you, we take the conditional distribution of Y given X, and we look mainly to the high dimensional uh, setting in the sense that the number of predictors in X can be higher than the number of observations here. You can uh, be interested interested by doing the regression clustering or whatever you want. Then we show that if you approximate this conditional density F in the class of mixture of experts, and what is the class of mixture of experts compared to what I just showed you before, if you take a kernel phi, which is almost the same thing like the, 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 the kernel I showed you before. It is located at some mu and with uh, mu, sorry, and with some um, uh, with some uh, scale uh, sigma. And if you integrate this here, and you call it just now mixture, which was before called mixture component, right? And now if you take in this construction of the mixture of expert distribution this way j indexed by k which is for uh, expert number k and here the main difference compared to the distribution before is that the weights also depends on uh, the input it is it, it is like in this in this picture I mean, each experts also learns from the predictor and the gating network also learn, learns from the predictor and then if you take this distribution, so mixture of experts H constructed open some experts phi. Each phi has some location in U and, uh, um, 
scale sigma and the weight, and we call it the weight in the nomenclature and the vocabulary of the steps of that's the uh, gating, gating function, gating network. For example, J, the gating network can be a soft mass. I suppose you all know about the soft mass. And then if you take uh, for P more than one, or one or more, if you want to approximate a conditional density f of y given x that is continuous, and if you take a, a, a kernel phi that is also con continuous when x is zero one, uh, then you can approximate if you take uh, more and more number of x pairs, you can very well approximate in the Lebesgue sense. The, the unknown uh, the unknown density conditional density sorry okay and if if you are working in a lower dimension of course this is not in practice very interesting but if d is one if in one dimensional and then this convergence is almost uniform so the, the uniformity so the sense of convergence is uh, more interesting okay so the conclusion is that for mixture we if you use mixture of excess to conditional density uh, uh, approximation, typically in regression, you want to predict y given x, and then they are they enjoy universal approximation capabilities, right? You can also play with them. Here, the distribution I showed to you before, this is a mixture of fixed pairs with k components. Here is your softmax. And if in your expert, for example, in the example I showed you before, you can take a Gaussian extent, it is about get simple Gaussian regression. If you feel, for example, that your data, they are not symmetric, they, are, uh, they for example, present some tails, uh, their properties are different from those of the Gaussian, and then you can add some parameters. You can personalize your, your expert. For example, you add the parameter lambda that accounts for asymmetry. You can, uh, uh, you can add a parameter new, who, which can account for the degrees of freedoms, okay? And at the end, you can accommodate the bit complex situations in which you can have, for example, like in this distributions, data that is, that is not symmetric, as you can see here, and their tail are different compared to the those of the Gaussian, okay? And typically, the tails, uh, the question of tails is important, Interesting, at least to deal with uh, a typical observation. If you see this figure, maybe it's not clear in um, in, in the slide, but here uh, we put many observations, and they are compared to the, the main sample. They are outliers, okay? And if you apply the simple mixture of experts here and there, this is the prediction of mixture of uh, of uh, Gaussian experts, okay? So the prediction is not really uh, not really robust. If you just add some uh, degree of freedom, you replace, for example, your Gaussian by Kisudan distribution, you, the approximation is correct, is much better. The same thing, okay? So the message mixture of experts, and they approximate well, you can personalize them. Of course, we share, I'm not going to talk about these two sites. We share these things open source. Feel free to play with them, okay? For both um, the non robust traditional and for the robust part, okay? I will share the slide later. And we can apply this modeling also for some uh, other applications. When uh, we looked at that uh, with colleagues from uh, McGill, I was uh, um, I was uh, well surprised to discover that even for such simple statistical models, it works quite well for images. We just uh, specialized them a bit. What we did, so what you can do, you take your mixture of experts. If you need to 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 deal with kind uh, this kind of images, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to take uh, yeah to, to tell you a bit more about these images. We call that uh, the de images. They are kind of. 3D plus one uh, plus one data. Here we see the, the, these are 3D images, and each pixel in the image, each voxel, it has a curve like that. It is a level of energy. In fact, what these uh, radiologists do, they come to the image and they do some um, experiments to measure 
the degree of energy in electron volt at each at some predefined levels. Okay. The, why? Because in this analysis, they realize that for the uh, the location the voxels where there is uh, the tumor, they respond in a different manner, manner compared to the normal uh, the normal uh, the other normal regions. So at the end, you need to take into account the spatial organization of these data and also the longitudinal uh, uh, organization of these curves. Okay. And when we apply uh, this mixture of experts, what we uh, we did, we took the weights here, the, the soft max weights, and in V we put we put the geometric uh, uh, disposition. Uh, I mean uh, the the voxel coordinates in the image. And in the expert here, f of y given x, we put f the we put these curves of energy x. And as you can see in the example here, we really will. Uh, we're happy to see that the clustering of the tumor part corresponds quite well to the original annotation of the radiologist uh, in the sense of some dice score of uh, more than zero at dice score. Uh, it is something uh, um, that is uh, used uh, in this uh, in this context. Okay, so we compare the stuff with many other approaches. Of course, not surprise, surprisingly, uh, some people told the uh, Daniel you need to compare with deep learning, etc. And that's why you have been rejected, I think, from IEEE <laughs> image, image processing. But at least we, succeed, we have been successful to drop it uh, in another in another um, in another destination. But uh, in practice uh, you can see uh, it as a simple model that uh, provide a good result it is a good compromise between uh, uh, compared to deploying a, a large deep learning architecture for this thing okay. purpose why three in the definition of alpha k um, this one alpha alpha k it says this phi function phi ah yeah 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 thank you thank you Zafet, for this slide actually this one uh, traditionally it is uh, the soft nice. but we redefine it, it here as a normalized Gaussian. So phi here is the Gaussian. And it is phi, phi, phi 3 because it is constructed open the 3D coordinates of each function. 3 is the number of coordinate, RGB, uh, RGB coordinates of, of the Gaussian. So data is sort of time evolved. Like that is yeah, the data are the, the data are y and x. The data, the energy levels are y and x, y given x. The spatial data are here. The, the the voxel location, the pixel location. Okay, mm -hmm. it is like a spatial, uh, spatial, spatial temporal model. Spatial temporal. Spatial temporal. Spatial, uh, spatial is here and temporal is right. So it is. Yeah. Do this mixture of experts and uh, universal approximation equally uh, perform well on non-stationary and non-ergodic data sets? Um, I would say yes, because I, I, I do not uh, show. Uh, because so far we have seen the Gaussian distribution and the normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you are right. But in the codes I showed, we also host the fact that these curves here, you can look at these curves, enjoy some non stationary. Typically, we address, we address the first example I, sh I showed to you there. Sorry, I just go back to my first slide. Yeah. You can see in the code we segment this. We detect when the changing values, changing mean here, and also changing mean at the end. So we account for that, and it is on the code. I mean, in the simple case, you can take Gaussian, but what we also integrate is kind of Gaussian process. Do not call it Gaussian process. You can segment the data. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We call that. Uh, uh, RHLP regression head and logistic process to say okay so yeah I, so I will speak that because I will uh, take uh, the last part for uh, to present systemics here quickly to mention that uh, now we see how to play with them uh, um, uh, in some uh, situation including um, uh, asymmetry and uh, robust and uh, a typical observation in high dimension we also consider that for when the number of predictors is high, potentially higher than the number of observations. And even for functional predictors, my um, one message here is to say, probably some of uh, you are uh, familiar with the lasso. 
Traditionally, for the lasso, for the line regression, you penalize it to select the relevant features to the prediction. Here, what you can do is you can do the same thing to encourage the sparse solution. The difference is on two uh, on two points. Here, since it is a mixture, so you need to handle how locally to penalize uh, which one of your experts. This is the first aspect. So there is a, a hidden clustering dimension. And the second one is you have this regression, it's that regression, and these are this segregation parameters. But the message L1 regularization is still a good way to proceed, including for this mixture of expert uh, of expert uh, setting. And we also provide a result to mention that. In addition of selecting variables when you proceed with lasso like regularization, you can also do model selection, which is more general. You select a variable, you can also select the number of components within the mixture of expense, right? Without going into details here, as you can see, the loss we maximize, sorry, the, the likelihood we maximize, it is a penalization of. The, this uh, uh, log likelihood of the mixture of experts. And the penalization we use here, it is called the slope heuristic, because there is other kind of uh, ways to do with penalization. We can use BIC, Bayesian information criteria, or ATIT, AEC, et cetera. Here we use the, step, the slope heuristic by, uh, found by Pascal Massart uh, uh, from Paris and colleagues. It, it's one of its specificities that it is. It's not um, it's not asymptotic, okay? You can get a result for every n. It's not uh, it's, you are not supposed to have n goes to an infinity so that your result uh, holds. So here, to the message here, if your regularization pen here is well chosen, calibrate it well, then your risk here, in the sense of the Jensen Kullback library risk here, we try to uh, to target F, your unknown uh, target is F. And here, your model you use is H with penalization M, okay? And the model is mixture of expert. Then the risk is less than some constant here times the infimum risk. This is the oracle risk plus some terms. They vanish when N goes to infinity, okay? But this result is true. For every n, you do not. Uh, it's not only true when m uh, uh, n goes to infinity, which is uh, the result for a asymptotic criteria. Okay. So here you can get some interesting uh, theoretical results in a, in a, in a non-asymptotic uh, setting. So you can also find the codes of what I showed to you. Yeah, just to go. To this slide because I see the time is running. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, to finish with this part, I showed how to predict with a high, uh, with a high number of predictors. You can even consider predict uh, uh, to do to uh, to perform the task with time series predictors, like functional predictors. Theoretically, with uh, an infinite number of predictors. Here, for example, to predict the precipitation level based on the temperature during the year in some location here in Canada. Okay, so typically the predictors your x they are x of t in time it is a time series and your observation is y it can be a scalar here for example if it is the precipitation level. Okay, and we we organize the our mixture of experts in a way to accommodate that. I I, I uh, uh, I mean, um, it's not the objective to go into the more very technical stuff, but at the end, you construct rather than the standard linear predictor within each expert, but standard, but standard functional linear predictors. And if you regularize in the standard mode, including, for example, lasso regularization, what is lasso? You the, the feature. You, you select, uh, it will go to zero if it does not have anything 
to do with the, the, the predicted value, but it will not go to zero, change to zero, if really it is relevant to the prediction. If you imagine, we try to um, experiment that like that for these functional inputs, but actually there is no really any reason to suppose that uh, this time series to the, the, the variable related to this time series. So at the end, it's not a variable, it is a functional variable. So there's no only reason that theoretically to suppose that the whole function is zero everywhere that is the prediction. And we rather use another idea. We try to look the sparsity with respect to the derivatives, some derivatives of this function. If the zero derivative, so the function value itself is zero, that there is, it, it, we are like uh, in the lasso. If the first derivative is zero, that means the, your function at, at, at that time point is constant. If the derivative is one, that means if your function at some uh, time uh, time slot is a uh, is uh, is linear, etc. And so this is what experimented. As you can see here, if this is what I was saying. If the functional parameter related to a time series input is zero, uh, that means that your input doesn't have um, relevance to prediction and etc. As I was explaining, and here. You can just see visually. Look, these are the, the estimated parameters for both the gating network here and the expert network. And this is the so regularization. Okay, but it's not too sparse as we could expect. But if you apply the sparsity constructed in the sense of this derivative function, you clearly obtain the sparse elements. To finish, we also can estimate these models for distributed data. One point here, what is distributed settings? Suppose you have your data, they are shared between many capital M sites and you need to estimate some of them. Of course, uh, you can use a mixture of experts, as we said before, it is a potential good candidate. You fit locally a different mixture of experts and they are the end, you want to get one. You can get, well, get one by simple, simply taking the average. But what happens here, if you take the average in the construction here, the number of components is M times K. But the model is only cont contains K components. So there is a, here a loss of interpretability. So what we did, we, we did a hint. We tried to, we tried to rather, rather than taking the average, we minimize the transportation loss between what we target with the K components and the distribution we get in the aggregation. Okay? And we obtain some uh, result. It works quite well. It is still, uh, it is still under, under review, but we have in our guide. The, here, of course, when we distribute, you gain um, in time, with time, you gain in time. We show that we do not, we do not, uh, you do not really lose a lot of performance here compared to our model here is the R compared to the global and the other ways of averaging of collaborating. The global, that means you take the whole data and you fit your model. Okay. It is interesting, but I'm not going to, to, to tell too much about that. It is under review so I mean you know tell too much so the same fact I cannot confirm <laughs> all the results we are having <laughs> but it is interesting sorry yeah you can find everything I mentioned before for the time that uh, uh I have maybe I will take a five or something minutes compared to what was expected if there is no trouble about that but uh, yeah, thank you um yeah, sorry, I was talking too, too much for the first part, but uh, uh, I, I think it is a, a good introduction to get to know each other. And now on the other side of my presentation at Systemics, and uh, uh, as I presented to some of colleagues I met with here at, uh, at Coach, uh, 
uh, and that uh, co-each uh, AI center. We are a research and technology organization at Paris Sacré. We are a nonprofit organization and we are a foundation of scientific cooperation. Mainly our mission is to work with academics and industrials to construct collaborative projects. Okay. And we have uh, eight scientific uh, and technological domains, including data science and AI, interaction and users, where I am um, the scientific uh, responsible. And we have also scientific computing optimization, research in uh, optimization and engineering system safety, digital security, IT, and the networks. Uh, these are uh, scientific uh, domains. Our main application area are those you see. There are four one automotive, industry, defense and security, environment, and health. Okay. And uh, we, we have been found, uh, we have been created by the government in 2012. Um, and uh, as I uh, explained to some people here, um, our daily life is to interact and to do research with people that are in industry and, and that are in academia. And they came and we work together in, we are located in Sacre, in Paris. How in data, so uh, what I'm going to present is about the data science, uh, AI and that interaction part. Our uh, main interests are in data, data coverage, data uh, operational domain design construction, uh, about um, uh, inter interactions and users, also about hybrid AI and trustworthy AI. Is hybrid AI, the first aspect is how in the construction of some solution to solve physical problems, how to use AI and how to use machine learning algorithms. Okay. And the first problems, they are physical problems. And there is a, a relevant um, approach, which uh, since the YC paper in 2019 attracts a lot of interest, which enables the deep learning or more generally the machine learning models to integrate a prior scientific knowledge based on physics typically physical law uh, that govern uh, the, the system uh, you study, okay? And uh, you, uh, we have uh, that in different area, including mechanics, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, etc. And specifically in engineering, our main, uh, our main uh, application site with our industrial partners, the integration of such physical laws uh, governing the study of engineering systems, it is really of very high interest. I mean, uh, an approach that is totally based on data you observe, it a priori would not really work really, very good since, for example, it will uh, not integrate the fact that uh, the pressure within uh, this cylinder, or nuclear cylinder, or, or I don't know what other kind of uh, physical system, it's not integrated, okay? I mean, the message all is not all about data, okay? And so what we need to do is how to augment this uh, uh, physical approach by data-driven approaches. And at the other, in the other side, when you use a physical tool, when you use some traditional solution to solve physical problems, in general, it is about simulation, but it can be really heavy. And the, the way of using machine learning is that you can try it oneself and then use inference in the next steps. So it is a way of saying, oh, I will gain in uh, terms of uh, physical simulation time. Okay? And I need to gain some time in my presentation also. <laughs> okay, so here are typical applications. Um, uh, as you can hear, we can this kind of physical problems in industry, for example, here in electricity, how to simulate in order to control and to supervise the network of uh, electricity distribution, for example, how to design uh, an, uh, an air, an air, an air, um, uh, how to call, how to call that, um, how to 
yeah, a piece in the plan. So the airflow design kind of that. Also, if you are working with people um, um, designing cars, how, for example, for the wheel, how to model the contact of the wheel with, uh, with the ground. And if in dynamic situation, if you have some flow around some years, how to model this during time. So the message here, these domains are challenging since, since these physical systems you, you encounter, they are complex to model and you cannot solve them analytically. Okay. And if you can find traditional solvers like a finite element methods, you need a lot of time to, to solve them. Okay. And about the scientific side for the scientific challenges, these problems, they are high dimensional, non-linear, complex structure. And so if you are going to use a machine learning you, uh, algorithm, you need also to integrate that. Okay. Um, I will skip this side because it just was to say uh, deep learning is one of uh, the interesting approach to see in the sense that uh, if you have some observations X and Y that came from a prior physical simulator, you can learn from it. Okay. And at the end, all is about solving partial differential equations. Typical partial differential equations are, for example, Navier Stokes equations. You encounter them in system like that. Okay. So deep learning are good candidates. Okay. And now in practice uh, and more formally, we have, for example, a program. Yeah. If you have questions. Okay. Uh, we have program called AI Squid for AI and augmented engineering. Oh, HSI, which is about uh, hybridization with physics, SMD, which is about semantics, hybridization with semantics and business knowledge, and CARD, which is about human AI interaction. Okay, the other projects we might talk about today. For the first um, aspect, as I was just saying, if you have, for example, a physical system here, which is high dimensional, here I think Emmanuel. Uh, uh, one of our former PhD students, they told me behind this there is a 1000 nonlinear equation. So it is nonlinear and high dimensional. Okay. And to solve that, one way to proceed is we can go from some first uh, parameters provided by a finite element uh, simulator, for example, and then to learn it by some machine learning. And then we are going to use the machine learning as a solidarity model for this physical simulator. So at the end, uh, at least we can augment this physical simulation by machine learning. And of course, in the IDA case, we are going to drop the physical simulation and use the data-driven machine learning. But of course, this is a, this is a, the, the dream. Of course, there is the, uh, the scientific challenges I just mentioned, how to deal with high dimensionality, non-linearity, and complexity of um, of the of this uh, of this uh, structure, so you you have finite elements. You can consider them as a as ground truth. You learn from them, and you 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 um, you, uh, you construct your deep learning model. Okay? And here you can see we are working uh, for that with some big firms in France in different domains. How, for example, probably you recognize this chart. <laughs> SNCF is for network trains, RT is for network electricity, the national uh, distributor of electricity. Erliki is also the big company of um, energy, uh, Airbus, LBS, etc. Um, a typical example, I, I have uh, other examples, but I, I will only use one. And uh, machine learning is generic. So if you learn, for example, an architecture for this kind of meshes in modeling the wheel, it probably you can just be adapted a little bit to use them about an airfoil, uh, an airfoil image. There is the generalistic part, which is interesting. You can also use a transfer learning if the problem is really huge. You can you can start with some coarse mesh here, and then initialize the next step with this first um, solution until you reach the final mesh 
you need, the final resolution you need. And it is mainly about graph neural networks because these structures, they are about meshes, okay? Here, for example, you are going to solve um, some contact equations and here come Navier Stokes equation. It can be different kind of equation, but the problem is still, uh, the, the solution can be still genuine. Okay. Mm, we have uh, an open source um, platform called GIPS for learning industrial physical simulation. You can um, look at it, especially maybe this. We organized one competition around it and we got uh, submissions from uh, more than 120 uh, participants, including academics and industrials and more than 1,000 uh, individual submissions. This is a close, but given the success of this first iteration, so we just launched uh, a second um, competition on another use case. So this competition was uh, on um, the use case of airfoil design, airfoil design. And this competition will be on the power grid use case. It is about the network of electricity and fans uh, by RT. Okay? So it is really a really good case. It is open for everyone, there is prices. Don't uh, be shy to promote it uh, for your uh, students. <laughs> okay. What kind of uh, model do you cover in that challenge? Everything you want. Like all transport equations, diffusion equations, and so Yeah, actually, uh, technically, the colleagues did the great um, uh, work to make sure that, uh, regardless of the model you use, we ask just you to um, configure your results in a way the evaluation benchmark, the, the evaluation method. And the evaluation code is common for everyone. And they even send you to run it locally before you submit. I see. Yeah. And together with physical constraints as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is actually, uh, yeah, you, can, you see here among the criteria, there is different type of scores. And um, the, the green is the better. Okay, for example, here if it is green here, that means the accuracy is okay, but if it is, uh, uh, if it is red uh, here, that means the adaptation to, to the domain is okay, so it doesn't integrate the physical part. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, the computational, um, there is the, the speed up, it can be a very, very, uh, very uh, quick, but it cannot uh, be accurate, for example. Okay, there is precise uh, criteria, KPIs to evaluate. Um, yeah, for semantics, we have a project called SRD for semantics and uh, multi-modal uh, data. The idea is uh, mainly about uh, text coming from business, including uh, these uh, partners, Airbus uh, and another uh, another firm of Airbus, EcoCCDF, and uh, Central is our academic partner. If they have um, business documents, how to construct a model that takes into account uh, the internal business language, okay, the semantics. We uh, do that in terms of ontologies as one way to, to proceed. And when you take the decision, how to go back and to integrate the logic, the, the business rules. Typically, and here is the one of the uh, work of uh, Arthur de Daganem and Ongul PhD. Suppose you have your text data, you construct um, your pre-process, etc. You take the ontologies like that and you learn, and then you can take decision, okay? The maximizing these posterior probabilities, the ordinary way to take decision. But here in this context, you cannot really do that. And what Arthur is doing is that, at uh, the decision, so when he will enter the model to, for example, the new corpora, rather than taking the decision rule as pi of y given x, he will take the rule pi of y given x and alpha, and alpha is a logical rule, okay? For example, if this quantity pi of y given x will maximize such decision, uh, uh, it, it is possible that compared to the same Maximization, but 
by taking into account the file, the, 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 the decision can be different. And this should not be surprised because alpha it is your way to encode the data. For example, if, for example, I don't know if you see this keyword and this keyword, that means you should call uh, the operator to say, uh, to tell the train to stop at this. But if you want to get the rule up and the, the expert document says, no, there is not any issue. You say you you tool you should tell the driver to continue because and because and because, and then you should take this decision to not uh, disturb the body. Okay. Um, maybe I think this is um, my my last uh, my last uh, or my uh, last slides. We are also we care about the human AI interaction. Um, in relation to the project I mentioned before, we have a, we have another project called CAP. It is about bidirectional assistance. When you learn from data and you take into account business documents or physical laws, etc., uh, this is not supposed to be enough because the experience and the feedback of the human, the real, the real expert, it it is real automatic. It is really the thing, the most important thing. So here, suppose you have, for example, your reinforcement or deep learning model, the document preprocess is very good, etc. You optimize it any logic rule you need, and then you take the decision. The operator, what happens? They look to the, the, the operator will look to the decision of the AI, but he or she, the expert, she can follow the decision or not. And so what happens if he or she follows the decision, that's okay. But if not, normally your model should learn from that as a feedback. Okay, and this is why we call this bidirectional assistant. So your agent of machine learning can learn from the feedback of the expert. And for example, here, if you have an, op an operator at some airport managing the traffic, if the artificial intelligence decision say, okay, this plane is delayed, we should stop it and uh, let the other plane uh, fly, the, the decision of the expert can be different because he is the expert. Uh, AI is about the uh, uh, help or an aided decision only. Uh, but if he, he or she takes a different decision, it is a good feedback. And sometimes in fact, the operators, when they take their decision, regardless of there is AI or not, they have some uh, forms to be out there. So this all this feedback is very, very rich information to AI. Okay. And so this card it is about that. Okay. Um, maybe I keep um fast forth AI and for another time because it will be too much. I mean we have a big program and maybe two words because I, I mentioned they will talk. To transport the AI, it is about, uh, yeah, mm, some K figures, it is about 45 million for four years. We are uh, piloting that uh, with uh, some uh, industrial big firms in critical systems. And uh, the main uh, scientific challenges are here, you can see them uh, for the ongoing PhD uh, thesis. And for example, we look how to prepare, to pre-treat, and to uh, design good data to the machine learning. So it is about operational design, domain design. And this is mainly the PhD subject uh, of Adrien. And then if you have a machine learning algorithm due to open good data, it should be robust to some attacks. And typically, Paul looks to robustness to what we call patch adversarial attacks. And you can use, the, for example, the human feedback to reinforce the learning algorithm. It is about the PhD thesis of Luca. And uh, uh, there is another um, dimension of trustworthiness we look uh, uh, at uh, in the program. It is about fairness, bias, detection, mitigation. If, for example, you have text documents and you, you want to take decision, you should take uh, the same decision uh, when you change what we call um, the, the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the sensitive features. Typically, if you have two CDs, you do not look at the sex, religion, etc. after at the person. 
Uh, so we look at this aspect. We also need to optimize the deployment of algorithms, and uh, Usem uh, looks at uh, at that. Um, for example, you, you simulate different uh, theoretical architecture, and you need to evaluate, given uh, uh, architecture A or architecture B, what is the, what would be the optimized thing to implement. And at the end, uh, when everything is deployed, implemented, is running, how to make sure that it will do the job you ask for it. And it is about monitoring the PhD of Fabio. And I am personally co supervising the PhD of Fabio Moriz and that. Uh, Thank you very much. I will stop here and uh, with the pleasure to speak uh, with you about other topics and uh, uh, if you have questions.